All right, Jason, thank you for being on Persistence Playbook today, my friends. Yeah, dude, appreciate it, bro. Let's kick it. Absolutely, absolutely. Let's kick it indeed. So, you know, when, when people think of paid ads right now, I mean, you come to mind. They think of you, $122 million in paid ad revenue. Ford Business Council, 30 under 30. You're running ads for Ryan Pineda, Pass, Pace Morby, et cetera. I mean, you're the man in this space right now. How did this happen? Oh, dude, we had to take a different approach with ads for sure. Um, like the landscape changed over the last four to five years for sure. And let's say like five years ago, anybody could run a Facebook ad and print and like make money. Like it, it was easier five years ago. You know, you could launch free plus shipping offers with books and T-shirts and all that. And it was easy to make money on upsells and downsells and take rates were higher because people had more purchasing power. Right. Now it's about like your offer and the copy and the messaging and the, and the storytelling and all these different nuances that most marketers don't understand. And like, that was the biggest thing for me was being able to like caress multiple facets of what a business actually like entailed with it. Right. Um, because after running ads for so long, dude, like I just realized that the ads don't really matter that much. The ads are just a precursor of the offer. It's just telling people what you do. Like, yeah, you could improve cost per click and CTR by fixing a couple of things. But like, dude, if they go to your landing page and nothing happens, like the ad doesn't matter. If they become a leader, they book a call and, and they don't close. The ad wasn't the problem. So like a lot of people focus too much on ads when it's really not the issue. It's like their whole entire ecosystem just like not dialed in. So I had to focus on, 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 on those principles. And then from there, you get into like, sales funnels and customer journey and product ladder and all these things like what kind of funnel works the best for our kind of business. So we had to be more like, you know, multi-dimensional with, Hey, this person should run a low ticket. This person should run an application to book call. This person should run a VSL. This person should run a webinar, like whatever that looks like. So having that situational awareness was definitely beneficial for sure. And like, dude, the crazy part is, is like me working with those big names that you talk about. I'm not like, like, yeah, dude, it's impressive, but I'm doing small things for them that make them a lot of money. And that's like where when you go to the top of the food chain, like you're not really doing a lot for these people. Like you're fixing a couple of things that make them more money. With people who are starting out that have zero money, you're doing way more. You're building their funnels, their VSL, their scripts, all these things, automations. They don't even know what a Zapier account is. Like you're doing all this shit from scratch. Right. But with these guys, they're like, hey, I got 10 salespeople and we can't handle the lead flow. Okay, let's. how, how do we hire 15 more? Like that's the small problem that I'm solving or like, Hey, our offer is this, how do we make it better? Let's add a guarantee and a time frame, and an if and clause. Okay. They make more money. Hey, I'm running an event. How should I split the room? Okay. Do 75% men, 25% women are right, sick. You make more money. Like all these little tweaks are just easier for them to make more money. So I just look like a God in their eyes <laughs> because they didn't think about it or like they run a funnel. And they have a big sales team, but there's no phone number on the top of the website. Right. This whole right. time they were like, oh, like, we don't, we don't, we don't want to put it there. I put it there. They make more money. I'm like, okay, it wasn't really that hard. Now, don't you think so, there's something to like, of course it comes down to the offer. If you're going to have a really long standing, successful business, you've got to have an irresistible offer that, that, you know, supplies great value. But don't you think there's some companies out there that just have the marketing and the ads so dialed in? That maybe the offer, I don't know. I'm thinking about like the V shreds guy, you know, like, <laughs> like, if but you dude, just keep... that's like, like V shreds all about that story though. Like the beginning of that VSL is very good. And Vince does a good job on that. Like they've tested thousands of openers and pattern interrupts and all that. Like, yeah, that's good marketing, but it's also good research and it's good copy and it's good storytelling and it's overall good infatuation. So like there is a precedent of that that when they get to the page, dude, they don't know anything about the offer yet. They, all they did was a quiz funnel and then they went to an actual like landing page, right? So the quiz funnel filters you to a certain VSL. That is a sales process. That has nothing to do with the ad. That's just like, hey, we know that if people click this option on the quiz, they are more likely to watch this video up to 60% versus them going to this video where they drop off at 38. That's all research, that's all data, that's all spending money. So like the copy and the offer piece yeah, dude, marketing's massively important. You can have great marketing and your sales doesn't have to be as great, but you still want your sales to be good because you still let people fall through the cracks. And then also, if salespeople are not dialed in, then they can't ascend people. And that's a whole nother part of the system. But like, 
you look at breakpoints in like most businesses, zero to a million is all marketing. One to three million is all systems. Three to seven million is people and seven to 10 is products. And then over 10 million is all Ascension, lifetime value, affiliates and partnerships. And, and that's how it's really divvied up. Most businesses get to certain breakpoints, and it's like, where do they go from there? But marketing just gets you to a million. Like everything else is just an increase in ad spend, but everything else then follows. So like, okay, you can get to a million bucks spending, you know, 500 to a $1,000 a day on ads. Okay, but you want to get to 7 million? You got to have the right systems to fulfill better and the right people. And then you have to five extra ad spend. Like that's what you're doing to get to 7 million. Would you say so the like, reason most businesses don't get to that $1 million revenue mark is just because they're kind of scared to spend money to make money and that mentality? Yeah, like they're scared to spend money. But dude, like here's the sad part is that people, they're scared. Of, like, okay, you, you asked – because I like to reiterate the question so people can understand where I'm going is you ask like, why can't people get to a million bucks? There's two truths. Okay. One is, is that dude, most people just like don't actually have what it takes to make a million bucks and they can't handle the money because they have childhood traumas. They don't let them make a million bucks a year. The second is yes, they're scared to spend money. And that's an obvious facet to, to point out, but like, dude, they're just not willing to, to spend the money to make it because it's just a big, like, it's just a big, trauma for them. And it's a big delay in their growth because you could give someone a million bucks. You can give a million bucks to a hundred people. I, I fucking guarantee you dude, like maybe 15 of them actually know what to do with it. The other 85 will blow it like fucking hats. So like, it, it's just like, <laughs> it's just the truth, bro. Like they don't know how to handle it. They're going to buy a car they can't afford. Like, and here's the honest truth, dude, is that like, bro, I've, I remember when I had a million bucks in my checking account. Like, I'll be honest, dude, like, it really doesn't go that far. Like, I know that's bold to say because people are like, oh, like, I only have 50 grand. Like, what is this guy talking about? When you're running a bigger business, dude, a million bucks can go pretty fucking quick. Like, when you're running an eight-figure business and you have 200, 300K a month in payroll, that shit could go away in, in three to six months. Pretty, pretty fucking quickly if you're not running the business efficiently. So, like, it's just funny. Like people talk about that stuff online. Like, Oh, like a million bucks. You're a millionaire. I'm like, bro, to be honest, like I didn't feel decently comfortable until I had at least two and a half, three mil, like set aside. That's where I felt a lot more comfortable. What would you say if, if you're talking to someone who's maybe just kind of getting started in, in the ads space for, for, for their business, what are the main pillars of a successful online ad? Main pillars. Um, Number one is like trust. I feel like a lot of things in the online space right now, people are weary of buying because of trust factors. So like, do you look trustworthy on camera? Number one. Number two is specificity. Like, are you specifically hitting the pain point with it, with an actual solution and telling people the guarantee time frame and expectation. So the specificity behind that third is storytelling with a combination of pain points, unique mechanism and relatability. So if you're saying stuff in your ad and you're talking about your story and you can't relate and you don't have this unique method to what you're doing and then you can't relate it to the audience, you lose them. And then four is giving them an actual like CTA. Like here's the crazy part, dude. People talk about call to actions all the time, but most people have no idea how to deliver one. They're like, oh yeah, just click the link below and like we'll, we'll set up a call. Like no, click the link below. <laughs> you're going to go to this landing page. You're going to click this button. You're going to go to a survey and then you'll book a call if you qualify. Like walking people through the process like a five-year-old. Important to be specific with your language, but also simple. Simple sells. Dude, some of the best performing ads that I've ever had are ones where I actually show them the landing page in the ad. Like a lot of my webinar ads that I run, I'm literally, I have my vibe board over here. It's like a big digital whiteboard and I put the landing page on it and like, I'm literally sitting there with money in my hand. I'm like, Hey, this Thursday, 7 PM Eastern, like free webinar, this page right here, you're going to click the link below. You're going to see this page. You're going to click this blue button that says, yes, reserve my spot. You're going to put in your info. And I'm going to shoot you over the zoom link and you can hop in the room. Like I tell them everything like they're a three-year-old. Is that what the thing's called? The vibe board, that digital yeah. whiteboard that I see you writing on in your content. That thing is sleek, man. I like that. Dude, thing. It's sick. Bro. <laughs> I, I love it. I'll be honest though. It's, it's overpriced, but it's cool. Definitely overpriced, but very cool. I mean, yeah. You know, I mean, come on. You're, you're getting plenty of views with those videos. So who's, yeah. to, who, who's to say it's overpriced if well, you're like, utilizing dude, to, it correctly. If you're thinking about it from a consumer perspective, you're sitting there going, okay, it's just a big TV. 
Right. It's probably one to two grand. Yeah. No, it's not. It's fifty five hundred dollars. It's overpriced. It's <laughs> okay. overpriced. I didn't yeah. realize it was that much. I think I was thinking more yeah. in more in the the one to two grand area. I yeah, I that's what, what right I there. thought too. When I first saw it, I saw it on uh I saw it on Russell Brunson's video one day. I was like, bro, I want one. And I went to look at it, I was like, fucking fifty four hundred dollars? What the hell? And then uh-huh. I dude, I was like, all right, fuck it, fine. Like it, it must is- be fun. You can't say no to the vibe board. I mean, it's called yeah, the vibe yeah. board. Come on. Yeah, it's cool. <laughs> what, what is, what's your average day look like right now? Do you have an average day? My average day? Um, I mean, dude, I, I, I'm pretty weird, bro. Um, Tell me about it. I know a lot, a lot of people might say that, but like I have a really weird way of operating my day. Nice. Let's hear so it. Like, I love it. Um, so, so, so you're not a, a cold plunge at 6 a.m. guy? So I am starting to cold plunge. I'm waiting for my, <laughs> my water chiller. I got this water chiller for the ice bath in the backyard. I got a sauna too. And I'm just waiting for it to get the temperature like set. I'm in Arizona, bro. It's hot as shit. So I'm battling a water chiller against 115 degree weather. So like outside it was at 90 degrees. Now I'm at like 54 ish, but I got to wait till it's like 45 degrees to really get a good effect. So, okay. So that's hap- like that I'll be doing. Um, second thing, dude, is like, I'll wake up and I take a drive in the morning. Like I can't start my day without getting some like good alone time and I'll just play music in the car and I'll go get Dunkin' Donuts. Nice. But dude, if I, if I don't start my day like that, I get pissed. Like, I'm not going to lie. Like if someone were to like, let's say I wake up at 6am, which in Arizona time is 9am Eastern, which is why I wake up at six because the world's already starting. So like if I wake up and, and someone's already up my ass about something, like I'm already mad. I'm just like, why, why do you have to do this at this early in the morning? Right. Like, let me have my, let me have my yeah. Dunkin' Iced before you, yeah. before you come at me, bro. Like I need, <laughs> I need my car ride. I need my music. I need my solitude. And then I can like think about shit that makes sense. Yeah, um, it's pretty powerful. So you kind of, a little car ride to kind of get your thoughts right. Get, get yeah. your Dunkin', get a, a nice shot of caffeine right, right into the veins and then, and then back yeah. to the desk. And then I go to Google calendar. I check out my day. I have our leadership meeting at 845. Um, and that's PST time. So I'll take that call eight forty five. Um, and then after that, I usually have a podcast slot open for somebody. You were on the second slot. So oh, I have two podcast, podcast slots number two today. All right. Yeah. So I got podcast slots on my calendar that I block off just for podcasts. Um, and then between that, I have my strategy calls with each strategy lead in our business. Like we have marketing managers. So I have a call with them once once a week to go over their accounts, give them advice, train them, et cetera. So those are always in the morning of my day. And then the rest of the day is group coaching, one-on-one coaching, and then private clients. Um, but, yeah. And then sure. like for maybe two, three hours, I'm doing fulfillment. I have a block just for fulfillment, which is the private mm-hmm. clients. So like, you know, yes, I'm doing their stuff, but I have a small team around it too. So I'm telling, Hey, like I'll tell my developer, Hey, we got to, you know, fix this on the landing page. I shoot them loom videos. I do fulfillment for two to three hours and then I'm done. And then that's really it for the day. So, yeah. so obviously, you know, your day right now, you know, you're running uh, a lot of different, um, you know, parts of the organization. You're meeting with a lot of people. It's probably a little different than maybe you were on the come up a few years ago. And I'm curious, kind of like, when you were on on the come up like you know th- three four or five years ago, or when you were really coming up in in the space, was it just like get up, make a to do list, and hammer out those items? W- w- was that kind of the the way yeah. that you operated? I mean, dude, I just used like ClickUp in the beginning. I just like wrote a bunch of tasks down on ClickUp, and I used to use that software as a solo printer. I would just put down all the shit I got to do. Okay, I got to fix this person's YouTube video because I guess I misspelled something in their thumbnail. That was back when I just used Fiverr and stuff as a solo printer. Right, right, um, right. And like, dude, fix this person's website. Their services page is messed up. Like, I used to do bottlenecking stuff like that. Because I think and a I lot of just, people are in that space right now. They don't oh, know how, yeah, to, how they to, they don't, they don't know how to organize their day. Like, should we? Should they be like time blocking out every moment, or should they just write down the top ten tasks and just hammer them out? Yeah. So, like, here's my big belief around morning routines, and, and this might like, <laughs> and this is not like an ego thing, but like, dude, here's the brutal reality around morning routines. They're stupid. Like morning, morning <laughs> routines are stupid. They, they just are. The only reason why you'd have a – if you look at all the people online who have morning routines, what do they all have in common? They all have money. That's why they have morning routines now. But when you don't have money, you don't have a morning routine. You have a get the fuck out of bed and let's make money routine. Right? And that, that's your routine. When you have money, you could be like, yeah, I want to do fucking – I want to go take a walk at 8 a.m. 
Right. But dude, when you're in fight or flight mode, there's no morning routine. There's no, at 7.15, I get my shaker bottle, I do my protein, and then I go to the gym. Like, that doesn't exist. Right. right. So that's the biggest thing that's misconceived about social media is that people are like, yeah, this guy's rich. He's got a morning routine. I'm like, yeah, because he's rich, and he can do whatever the hell he wants in the morning. <laughs> but two years ago, he was broke. He was fucking lost. So... <laughs> That's the biggest piece, dude. Like people don't understand that. And they take stuff in social media at like face value. And it's just like – like dude, three, three, four years ago, I didn't have a morning routine because I have high standards. Like anything – like when I was four years ago, dude, if I wasn't making 100 grand a month, I was pissed. I was like, I'm poor. Even if I was making 80 grand a month, I was still poor. I'm like, I'm poor. And I was just like, dude, I just wanted to set the standard. Maybe that's bold, but like that was just the way I lived. I was like, dude, I felt like I was in flight or – if I was making less than 75K, 50K a month, I was in fight or flight mode. I felt poor. Where does that drive come from? Have you always been such a driven guy? Um, I don't know. I think it was just like a premise of like if I could get to 50, I can get to 100. That's the other thing too. Like you always chase the next number. Like that's all it was, dude. Like once I hit 10K, like once I hit 10K a month – I was like, okay, I hit 10 grand a month. I can live. I can actually buy food that doesn't taste like shit. So, okay, we got to that point. And then I can go to a club and not care about a $30 drink. That's that's 10K a month. 25K a month is, okay, now I can buy all my favorite softwares and I can finally get a decent mid-sized sedan car. That's 25K a month. 50K a month is now I can pick the apartment and house that I want to live in. And then 75 is, okay, now I have extra money to buy the clothes that I want and get the extra upgrade on my iPhone and buy Beats headphones at the airport for 300 bucks and not give a shit. Like that's 75K a month. And then 100K a month is like, okay, I can go on vacation once a month. I can do staycations and spend a thousand bucks a weekend. I can like buy my mom cool shit or whatever that looks like. And there's like different levels to the income game. And I just... Yeah, I mean, dude, I just wanted to – I also am under the philosophy that I just want to make as much money while I'm young, while I have the energy. Sure. I think that makes a lot of sense. I do. Like, like a lot of people work. I see these guys right now, like like Robert Kiyosaki, all these guys, they're old. I'm like, bro, why are you still running webinars? What the <laughs> fuck? I'm like, bro, when I'm 40, I'm just going to be probably in like the VC game like and just chilling and, and doing – I'm not running fucking live webinars. Like, what are you doing? You're 45, 50 with kids. Like, why are you running a live workshop? I love it. I love it. Like, I, I want to be able to like retire by 30 to 35 easily. Yeah. So, oh, I'd there's say no you're shot. There's, there, yeah. There's no shot. I'm running an agency at 35 years old. You're out of your fucking mind. There's, I, I, there's no way. I'd say no you're way. on your way. So it sounds like, you know, there's definitely like some intrinsic motivation there where you just kind of want to like get to that next number, continue to grow and kind of see what you're capable of. But it seems like, you know, there's also just some, some financial motivation there too. Of course, everyone that follows you on Instagram sees the Aston Martins and, and, and the fancy cars. But would you say like uh, some of that is a big part of what drives you as well as being able to um, own the nice things? I mean, dude, the nice cars are fun, but like, all it is, dude, it's just like a validation piece. It's like, hey, like you're doing something correct. Like when you don't have cars, you make money to buy cars. And then you get cars and you're just like, okay, like I'm smart. Like I was able to buy a nice car. I'm smart. I'm not stupid. And then like you buy your next car and then you realize that it's just a car. Like, And also the, the, the third thing, it's all about like persona. Like, dude, let's be real. Like if I'm driving around in like a Toyota, like no one's going to take me fucking seriously. Like, like, let's just be real. Like That's no one's going to take you seriously. No one's going to sit there and go, Hey, I'm going to carve out my day to look at this guy's stuff. Cause it's all about day trading attention, dude. It's no accident that people that are young, my age who do very well buy these cool cars. They do it because they just want to tell themselves that they're doing a good job. That's really it. And then like, dude, like the cars, are they motivation? Honestly, they're not really motivation. I just don't want to leave my house and drive a piece of crap. Like, I just don't want to do that. I'd rather drive <laughs> to my destination. It's something decently nice. Like, if it. you're driving somewhere, people get mad. They're like, oh, I'm in traffic. I'm like, bro, I don't care about traffic. I'm in a McLaren. Who gives a shit? I'm enjoying this. This is great. I'm enjoying this. Yeah, like, do people get mad? I'm like, yeah, because you look in front of you. There's a Toyota symbol. I wouldn't be fucking ecstatic either. Jason Wojo. Like, big, he's bored. big traffic guy. Big traffic guy. <laughs> 
Like, dude, it's, just, it, it's the little things, bro, because people let that shit ruin their day. Because what do they do? They're working a nine to five. They come home and they're like, oh, they're all mad and shit. Their wife cooked them food. It's not that great because it's not A plus fucking Wagyu. Like they're sitting there. They're mad. And they're like, I was in traffic, blah, blah, blah. But if you were having a nice lifestyle and you came home to a filet mignon, like you wouldn't be fucking mad about it. Have you ever I had know, that, dude. the Wagyu? I had that for the first Hell time yeah. at a buddy's birthday. Bro, like the real so stuff. Good, bro. Oh, my that, good. Yeah. It the, like melts uh, in the, your mouth. Dude, the A5 is like butter. Yeah. I don't know what it was, but it was good. But yeah. Yeah, like stuff like that, dude. Like that stuff's cool to eat, but it's not worth 90 bucks an ounce. It's not. Right. And it was. Like you do it – you do it once and you're like, wow, that was good. But now when I go out, that's not my goal is to rack up a restaurant bill. Like it's just not my goal. Like people are like, oh, you're not going to get the Wagyu? Like are you broke? I'm like, no, dude. It's – it. first of all – it's a rich taste. Second of all is it's not going to fill you up. It's six out six ounces, 500 bucks. Like, dude, I need eight to 10 ounces to be able to eat. Like I'm not doing that. It's stupid as hell. It's stupid. It's all for an Instagram <laughs> video. It's stupid. Curious about like where your focus lies on a daily basis. But would you say that like 99% of your day, you are pretty much laser focused on building your business and your brand right now? Like, do you let your mind even kind of wander onto seemingly meaningless topics? Or would you say you're pretty laser focused on, uh, on your goals on a daily basis? Yeah. I mean, daily basis, dude, I'm focused on things that are actually going to like move the business forward. But most of it now, man, is like, yeah, it's about business, but more about personal brand, doing more content. I'm investing a lot of money into like social media right now, editors, fan pages, all this shit. So like the more podcasts I do, the more people I meet and the more communities that I like go speak at, the more money that I make. Like, yeah, dude, I could raise ad spend, but like the more people who know about me, the more people buy. It's just, that's just like intrinsic reach. And there, and there's a big piece I want to make about this, which is that in business, there is like, there's intrinsic value and there's intrinsic. And a lot of these like podcasts and stuff are intrinsic. It's not a direct ROI. There's no, hey, I'm on a podcast with Brett and I'm going to make 40 grand right now. No, it is. I'm going to make this podcast and three weeks down the road, someone's going to view your podcast and they're going to follow me and then they're going to buy six months later. That is intrinsic value. You just don't know what's going to happen. And like when I do more podcasts and speaking events, dude, I'm telling you right now, people buy. Same thing with, 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 with my book. That's a brand play. The book does well. Like we just got a sale an hour ago and this guy paid in full. He bought the book last week and he didn't even get the goddamn book yet. He read the ebook and then he bought a package from us. Like, dude, those things are intrinsically valuable where I'm not directing an ROI to it. It's a thing to get in your hand. It's a physical thing that you could touch. Jason Wojo wrote this book. Okay, cool. I have it in my hand. This is cool. And I can trust him now. Cause this online shit, dude, like everyone's just like scared to buy things because they're like, Oh, I'm going to get scammed when most of the time, bro, just to be upfront, uh, we're not scamming you. You scam yourself <laughs> and people don't realize that they're like, Oh yeah, I bought this program and it was a scam. I'm like, did you go through it? Yeah. Did you implement it? Yeah. I'm going through it. Still. Yeah. No, you're an idiot. You didn't right. do it. You didn't implement the oh, program. Yeah. Oh yeah. I did it once and it failed. Okay. Did you try it a second time? No. Okay. You're an idiot. Like you can't call things a scam when you're the one who scammed yourself. It's crazy, dude. People buy a thousand dollar course and they're like, yeah, it, it just let me down. Like the material is so high level. Okay. If it's so high level, do they have a done for you program? Yeah, but it's eight grand. Okay. You're poor. You might as well go eight grand more poor and buy it. <laughs> like I just don't get it. It makes no sense, bro. It's crazy. And those are the people who complain, who make all the videos online about, oh, this person's this, this person has a shit course. Bro, it's not our fault. We gave you all the materials. Yeah, but I didn't want to raise my ad spend because my closer wasn't closing. Okay, then you go take the fucking calls and then you go hire someone who's new. Yeah, but that's a lot of work, Wojo. Okay, well, you're lazy and you suck. Okay, cool. Done. <laughs> Next person, like, that's it. We didn't, we, we didn't scam nobody. You just, the 89% of businesses fail in five years. Just think about that one stat and you'll realize why people call things a scam because they don't want to look at statistics and they always want to be emotional about shit. No one cares about your emotions. No one gives a fuck. doesn't at, matter. Never did. At its core, 
why do people buy things? Because of curiosity. That's it. Why do people buy shit? Okay, you go to a store and you see a nice wall, a nice shirt. I wonder how I'm going to feel if I wore this for a whole entire day. Or, hey, I wonder if this is going to really make my outfit pop. Or, hey, if I wear this brand, are people going to like me more? Like, it's all curiosity, dude. It's not – like, they don't – like, little do people buy shit. And here's the funny part. When you buy things that are needed, that are impulse, they're always the most expensive. Like, oh, like, for example, like, I got to get my fucking gardening thing fixed now. I guess one of my uh, stupid people. So the, 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 the whole thing that self waters my plants, okay, doesn't work anymore. Okay. I Done. bought this house two months ago and like, I'm thinking maybe 400 bucks, 500 bucks to fix the water thing. No, $1,200 to fix this fucking thing in the back. So like, ouch, that's ouch. more expensive to fix urgently. Right. But then if you go out to the mall and you buy a shirt, it's 40 bucks. It's curiosity. There's no need for a fucking t-shirt. No one left their house and said, yo, I need a t-shirt like today. Like how like you lived without wearing a shirt. You know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> so that's the biggest piece too, is that the things that are the most urgent that solve the biggest problem are always the most expensive. How can we build more irresistible offers as business owners? You have to think about your avatar and say, if I told this person this one line, would they buy? And what would be their biggest objection if they didn't buy? That's all you have to ask yourself. When I write copy, I know that sounds really simple, but let me just break this down. When I write copy, I write one sentence and I ask myself two questions. Does this make any sense? And what are people going to object to what I just said? And that's it. And I answer those two questions. I fix it. I go to the next line. And that's all I do, by the way. That, that's literally it. That's your copywriting formula right that there? That is how I do it every damn time. The king, of, the king of copy just told us how to do it right there? Because people write copy with their ego in mind. Oh, I know what people want. No, you don't. If you knew what people want, you'd be making more money than everyone else. You have to look at what the market wants. I've heard you say that before. Look at what the market wants because you don't know inherently. Um, how do we actually figure that out tactically? Is that just posting more content, posting Honestly, more ads? Bro, yeah. It's just spending money. Like you're only going to find out what the market wants unless you run ads in front of them and let them dictate to you, Hey, this was a successful messaging campaign into my brain that I decided to buy from. Like people always say, like people always ask me this question and it's such a cliche question. Are videos better than images? I can't tell you enough how many fucking times people ask me that question every single day. Well, Joe, should I run videos? Okay. Run ads and find out which one's better for your space. I don't know. Maybe showing up before and after is better than doing a video. I don't know. And they're like, yeah, but like, which one do you think will win? I don't know. Let the market <laughs> decide. Like, I don't know. I don't know the fucking answer. Like, I don't have I do? the crystal ball. I don't have it. You got to ask Dude, the market. People, people really don't realize that if I had a crystal ball, I'd be sitting on a yacht making millions a day and bullshitting my time away if I had a crystal ball. Like you're, I don't you're going to get there though. I can tell, I can tell 35. You'll oh, be on a yeah. yacht. Totally bullshitting time away with the best of them. <laughs> <laughs> no doubt. I, if I had a crystal ball, I could see that in your future. No, no, no doubt about it. That's like, dude, people want the one trick pony. Cause here's the problem, dude. And like, I have no hate. Like me and Russell Brunson are, are decent friends. We, we talk on Instagram and whatnot, but dude, I'm not going to lie, bro. He kind of ruined the space. I hate to be that person, but he did. And he ruined it by saying that you're one funnel away. Like he fucking ruined the marketing. Guy. Like he really did. Like do all the love to Russell. If you're watching this, bro, I'm sorry. But like you really fucked up everyone's heads for years. Yo, you're a coach. You're one funnel away. No, they're not, bro. They're 25 funnels, 30 grand in ad spend, three fucking salespeople who quit, um, two car accidents, fucking – health condition and 30 other traumas away from making money and 300 sleepless nights. That's what the fuck they're away from. But you can't, can't say can't that, fit that on can't, a t-shirt. <laughs> yeah. You can't, you can't fit it on a t-shirt and you can't fit it in someone's dilemma because they're scared to go through it and experience it. If you tell someone that dude, they're like, yeah, fuck that. I'm out. You know, I like, do. It's just tough, bro. It's hard to instill that. So if someone's really just getting started with, with running ads, right? Do, do you, let, let's say like they've got a business that's doing well. Do you think they should just 
outsource it right away to someone like yourself? Or do you think they should get in there and kind of learn it a little bit on their own before considering outsourcing it to uh, a real expert? So this is why we have multiple products for multiple people. Like I think that they should work with somebody because I have a one-on-one -on -one program that people really like where they get to learn and beat the learning curve and like they get to learn and prove their concept on their own. Like, dude, people, there's two avenues. If you have no data and you're like, okay, I have no data, I'm going to take my shit to a marketing company. How are they going to help you? Like, they're not you. You're the business owner. You have to take control of your business. You've got to prove your concepts that if you went to a, a, an marketing company on the second path and said, hey, what's up, Wojo Media? I run $200 a day in ad spend. I'm getting $17 a lead and $64 a book call. How can you help me? That is a better client for handing it off. But if you just go to us and you have nothing, dude, what are we going to do for you? Like, we're going to have to charge you more. You're going to have to wait a longer period of time. You have to spend more money to prove the concept with us. Oh, but I don't want to spend that. How soon can I see results? I don't know. I have no fucking clue. Maybe tomorrow, <laughs> maybe in three months. I don't know. But dude, people are so like lost in the space because ads are click and publish. It's like gambling. 100%. You go to a fucking casino, you swipe your card, fucking pull the thing, and you get a result. People go to Ads Manager, they click the create green button, they make an ad, they spend money, and all of a sudden they're like, oh, I didn't make any money. No shit, bro, this ain't a casino. Like, you can't just go there and just every single time you pull. Like, it's just, dude, it's crazy to me. So, like, because when I coach real business owners who are making real money, they understand this shit. Like, dude, I have... Okay, so this is a really good example. Like there's a difference between somebody who has no fucking clue to run a business and someone who runs a real business. You go on a call with somebody and you're like, hey, because to do one-on-one -on -one with me is either 10 or 20 grand a month, okay? People will go 10 grand a month and they ask questions like, hey, um, you know, we're going to you know, get you on board in the next week, but we could pay now, right? And I'm like, yeah, of course you could pay right now. They don't give a shit. And then you get the people who don't have any money, who don't know how to run a business, and they're the questions they ask. And uh, can we get our ads launched this week? You think we'll see results in the first 24 hours of the ads running? Do you guys have any guarantees? Like those are the questions they ask because they're idiots. <laughs> but like, dude, the 10K a month, 20K a month clients, like I landed a 20K a month the other day, and the guy's like, yeah, we know the first month's a wash. We're going to Cabo in a week. We don't really give a shit, but we're going to pay today. Those are the questions. Those are the things that they say. That's not to. That's why it's better to, they, to solve to solve rich people's problems. Because yeah. <laughs> they because they, 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 <laughs> they value time more. Right. But when right. you have no money, you have to spend money to get knowledge to then buy back time. And people don't want to just spend the money because they don't have any money. When you don't have any money, you don't value money. You value the increase in money, but you don't value the power of it. You're not worried about power. You're worried about being comfortable and being able to survive because you're in fight or flight. But as soon as I give someone 10 grand, now they're like, I got to keep the shit. I got to hoard it. I don't want to spend it. This person wants to pitch me a 20 something thousand. Fuck that guy. I'm keeping my money. That's how they think. And that's sure. why they're broke still. Well, it's two different mindsets. You can view money as a tool to, you know, to enhance your reach and, uh, and your impact, mm -hmm. or you can look at it as a survival mechanism where I'm just going to hold on to every bit of this, you know, so, yeah. so that I have a roof over my head. And, you know, most people are in that camp. They're not, they're not, they're not in the mm -hmm. former. So I've, I've heard you talk about this, which is kind of a controversial take that you don't hear too often. And niching down is a money killer. I heard you say that once. And I was just kind of curious if you could go into that a little bit more. So like, okay. So that's like a bold statement that I say when I say I don't niche down. Here's the thing. If you're really good with people and systems, I could service 15 to 30 different niches really, really well if I just built good SOPs around each niche. Like we do well with a lot of niches, credit repair, agencies, business funding, webinars, low ticket, like the list goes on. We're able to service all the niches because we found a couple of avatars that did well and we built good templates and SOPs around it and good direction and good pivoting metrics for what would dictate a good campaign. If I only service one type of audience, to be honest, dude, it's boring. Like when people are bored, they do dumb shit, right? You could be a sales training company and, and you're like, yeah, that person's niche. They train sales teams in different niches. 
Like the whole niching down thing is a very like sideswiped conversation. Like what if you're an e-com store who's getting a three row as, and the difference between you getting a three and a five is more upsells and cross sells and better email. Now you're a CRO company. You're not a marketing agency and you can still service that client because you know the actual lever to pull. Not just because I don't service, like I want to serve as many people as possible. Like, dude, I know that anything with traffic and good messaging will get more leads and money. So what should I do? Go to fucking everybody and say, yo, you're a coach. You help people increase their sales close rate by 30% within 30 days where they get their money back. Dude, let's package that shit and sell it. Oh, but Wojo, we only work with gyms. Are you an idiot? It's the same infatuation. Same, like, dude, it's the same thing. Take it and take it to a new niche. Then that niche gets results. What do they do? Yo, I work with this company. They increased my close rate by 30%. I know another gym that you could help. I know this guy who runs a car dealership that you could help because the framework's good. Okay, I'll go to him at the dealership. I'll help his ass out. His salespeople suck. Cool. Like, it should work. Is it more no, to change the messaging on yes. the advertisement? Like, maybe the yes. product is the same, but the messaging the towards, the, same. towards the, the realtor is different than the messaging towards... The, the coach because you have to look at the framework of what's the sales process is it, is it a one call close two call close what's the biggest objections from for realtors what's the biggest objections for gyms what's the biggest objections for med spas like you just research your industry i have ran ads in so many niches and been very successful if i could do it why would you not want to go broad and serve the masses you know like there's clients who come to us too and they're like, hey, I'm running this funnel. It's not working. Okay, switch it to a webinar and they make money. And they're like, why'd you do that? I'm like, because I have situational awareness because I have universal experience to make that decision. We had a, we had a trader come to us. He was like, yeah, I want to run a $7 a month program where people come in and they just pay $7. I'm like, that's a stupid fucking idea. How much is your product? He's like, oh, it's $9.97. I'm like, we're going to run a webinar. And we ran a webinar and it made money. He's like, how'd you know how to do that? I'm like, because I have situational awareness. Your $7 a month idea was stupid. But if I was niched down and I pushed everyone through that, now it's a saturated $7 a month. Everyone and their goddamn mom's running a $7 a month school group or whatever it is. You got to have situational awareness to know where to pivot. Now, I heard, had, I've heard you talk about, though, the importance of always having a low ticket offer out there for, I suppose, the goal of email collection. Email collection and self liquidation. Being able to, if you spend a hundred bucks a day, um, and I, I, I have a couple of minutes here because I have a meeting to hop on. But we'll um, like, if you if you are spending a hundred bucks a day, and I get ten people to buy a seven dollar product, I got ten buyers on my email list for thirty bucks. Technically, they paid. So important to have a low ticket offer out there at all times, collecting potential buyers because there's a little bit more investment, even if it's a $2 investment and, and there's just more even proclivity to buy a $1 as opposed to a free giveaway. Because they put their credit card in. Biggest, my first mentor ever, Greg Berry, always said to me the most important quote ever. And this is why I don't take people's actions or words anymore. People only vote with their credit cards, not their mouths or actions. And I swear that is the most truest shit on the entire planet. There it is, like, brother. Like, I could sit there all day with that guy in the backyard about the gardening. Okay, but on tell him about my credit card, dude, no one gives a fuck. Yeah, man, come by next week. Okay, well, I got the invoice and I paid last night. It doesn't matter. Until I swipe my credit card, the only thing that matters is thou, that I committed to do it. But if you talk to somebody, they're like, yeah, I'll talk to you next week. Dude, they didn't pay shit. They're going to forget about you. The oh, most brother. thing that people are hoard to is the money. Yeah, I'm really thinking about moving. Buy a fucking house. Until the card gets swiped, no one cares. It doesn't matter. Until the card swiped, no one cares, brother. I think no I, one cares. I think we no can one tie, cares. We can tie a bow on it right there. Jason Wojo, thank you for being with us today. I appreciate it. Yeah, I appreciate you too, bro. Where, where can everyone keep up with you online? I'm sure they're already following you, but, but let's tell them yeah. anyway. Uh, they can just go at T H E Jason Wojo. So at the Jason Wojo. And if they want to book a call, want to see if we're a good fit, they can go to jasonrunsads.com forward slash scale, or they can just click the first link in my bio on Instagram. There it is. Go do all the above. Jason Wojo, you are a stud, my friend. Thank you for being with us. This has been Persistence Playbook, and we will catch you next week.